So welcome everyone to um, the quantum theory of wine. Um, we're happy to have you participating in our virtual homecoming in 2020. There is a lot going on and I hope that um, you're enjoying yourselves and we'll see you at some events tomorrow. Um, I'd like to especially welcome um, our acting vice chancellor, Mark Preble. Um, hello, Mark. He's been here early chancellor, on. Not Bob vice chancellor, Amory. And um, also, I would re be remiss if I did not um, tell you that Matt Witzkel, our um, Alumni Association Board President, is also here. So welcome all. My name's Anne-Marie Reddy, and I'm pleased to be hosting this event. Potiphar is a Rhode Island institution and definitely a treasure. It's certainly among the best that Rhode Island's bright culinary scene has to offer. Um, it's a welcoming French bistro if you've not been there, and the owner, Bob Burke, and his staff make every diner their priority. We're lucky to have Bob here with us tonight to teach us all some of the secrets to how to pair wine with food. So thank you, Bob. Um, before I hand over control to Bob, I do want to say that um, he will take questions, but if you could let him go through his presentation so that um, we can get to the end and then he'll spend, you know, 10 minutes or so answering people's questions. Okay. So Bob, we're off to you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. And uh, uh, really delighted to be here and uh, with the UMass Dartmouth community. I uh, got to spend some time this morning with uh, your now globally uh, known luminary, uh, Professor Aaron Bromage. And um, Many of the things we did here at the Potiphar restaurant to keep safe uh, with COVID, we did because of the science uh, that he um, uh, reported uh, and helped us make dining safe, saved jobs, kept us going, which is really fantastic. So I started off uh, tonight uh, with the mask on, even though I'm alone in the room, uh, but I am gonna take it off now. Uh, but I did, in deference to Professor Bromwich and all the work he's doing to stem the virus, I felt I ought to at least start off um, with that message that he delivered today about how important those are. So um, welcome to all. Uh, this uh, wine tasting is, um, is a little different. You, I hope, won't think the same about wine when you get done. Uh, a lot of people are intimidated by wine. It's one of the only, you know, you're all in the business of uh, teaching people. This is one of the only areas of human knowledge where someone who possesses the knowledge seems to love making people who don't have it feel very stupid. And uh, usually we're eager to tell people about knowledge we have. We want them to share it, learn it, practice it. But somehow in the world of wine, you know, it's, it's a little different. So let me give you an example. I would like to start off by let's do the old Coke Pepsi challenge. So everyone who prefers Coca-Cola to Pepsi, I would like you to wave right now. Okay, give me a wave if you are a Coca-Cola instead of Pepsi. And now everyone who's a Pepsi lover, you wave. Really, really, you really like Pepsi? Really? I mean, are you kidding me? Have you ever really tasted Pepsi? I mean, are you serious? You really like Pepsi? What's wrong with you? When well, you mix it with the rum, it doesn't really taste much different. See? But here's the thing. No one would ever try to make you feel stupid for not liking Pepsi. But if you had just tasted Chateau Lafitte Rothschild and you said, Blech, I would say, Oh my God, what's wrong with you? Don't you know anything? See, that's the difference between wine tasting and other things we like. And we need to get rid of that. We need people to really feel like a good wine. And people ask me all the time, Bob, what's a good wine? I say, a good wine is a wine that tastes good to you because your palate is different than my palate. You may have a sweet palate, meaning you like sweet wines. You may like a dry wine. Okay, you may like a spicy wine. You may like a wine that's really full. You make a wine like a wine that's really light. And the thing that I want people to realize today is, is, is that that is perfectly fine. This is not something where you're trying to get a degree in wine, where you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, 
how to answer properly if somebody says, oh, you just had that fancy wine, I can't believe you don't like it. There's lots of fancy wines you wouldn't like. And there's nothing wrong with not liking. Them. That's the first thing is, is I want you to be more comfortable about drinking wine and not feel like there's a right answer, okay? There's some answers that are better than other answers, but there's no perfect wine in all situations. So that's what we're gonna start with. And what we're gonna to go to is, is we've got some different components here. We got glasses, we got some wine openers, we got some bottles, and I'm gonna to explain to you everything about all of them in the next you know, 45 minutes. So the first thing we wanna talk about is how do we get in the bottle, right? That's always a problem. Everybody's sweating that one out. So if it's a champagne bottle, it's really difficult. And you know, it's gonna pop and go all over the place. Uh, and there's a technique to that. We're not gonna do that today because we don't have enough time. But what we are gonna do is we're gonna take a look. I wanna show you something. See this bottle? This is a traditional Bordeaux bottle. So the package, the bottle, a label, a government label that goes back to the 1800s, government regulations in France, there are only certain things you can put on this label. Has to tell you where it comes from, okay? And then this bottle, Look at how differently they're shaped. A long sloping shoulder, okay? This one, let me tell you, this shape that you see, Chardonnay, is from Burgundy. The Burgundy makers use the bottle to tell you that this bottle shape comes from Burgundy. This bottle shape comes from Bordeaux. You didn't even need to look at the label to know that if you see a French wine that's shaped like this, it's coming from Burgundy. If you see a red wine in a shape like this, it's coming from Bordeaux. So right away, the winemakers are already telling us things. Now, the interesting thing is all around the world, Chardonnay makers, Australia, California, Chile, all in, uh, in, in respect to the French, to the region of Burgundy, all put their Chardonnays in this shape bottle. You will almost never see a Chardonnay in any other shape. Same is true. This is the same shape bottle. It's red, it's from Burgundy, it's Pinot Noir. That is the great French grape that we tend not to know about. We all think about Cabernet Sauvignon and in here is Pinot Noir. So the shape of the bottle right away tells us something about the region that the bottle is from or the grape variety that's in it. Now, getting into the bottle can be very difficult. So what has happened? is they've started doing this, screw caps, terrible. Who wants that? No, we want to make it harder than that. Now, I'm going to show you how you open a bottle of wine properly. Now, I've got some uh, wine openers here. This is a pretty good wine opener. It's not bad, okay? Does a good job. You just twist it around, and it goes in, and the cork comes up. Um, this wine, this is a cutter, foil cutter, so that you can cut the foil. But you should have a wine opener that has a little knife on it, like this does, okay? So that you don't have to buy one of these separately, okay? This thing, definitely invented by a boy. I mean, who would go through all of that in order to open a bottle of wine? I mean, really? Forget it. And this thing, if you got one of these things, okay? The little, hi everybody, hello, hi, hi. Okay, if you've got one of these, use it for jokes and throw it away because it is a worthless piece of wine opening equipment, okay? I mean, it's absolutely worthless. So what we've got here is these different bottles and this one we're gonna open this way, okay? We're gonna open this one up just like this. And I'm gonna pour a little bit of it. Oh, I gotta pour that over here so you can see. I'm gonna pour a little bit of it. And there we go. And that's yours. I have an audience here now, that's your wine. And now I'm gonna show you though, this is the perfect wine opener. This is the wine opener you wanna get, okay? And it is one of the most perfect machines that you are ever going to encounter. And I wanna show you how brilliant it is, industrial design. It has four parts. It has a knife right here. It has a body, okay, right here. It has this great little lever, which we're gonna hook onto the bottle, and it's got the screw. Who can tell me, for bonus points, who invented the screw? 
No, it wasn't Buddy Cianci. Archimedes, it's an inclined plane that he twisted and made it circular, creating the screw. So the first part of the tool that we're gonna use is the knife. And we're gonna take the knife and we're going to cut around, just like this, like a paring knife, right around the top of the bottle. Now this is called the capsule, okay? It used to be called the lead. It's not called the lead anymore. The reason it's not is because the state of California said, no more lead in capsules. And since every winemaker in the world wanted to sell their wine in California, they started turning them into either metal or plastic, which are tough to cut, which is why you're gonna want a serrated knife, a sharp knife on this. It used to be soft and easy. Now, the reason that they did that wasn't because you were getting stupid if you were drinking a lot of wine, it's because millions of pieces of lead were going into the environment and they were breaking down and leaching into the water supply. So California said, no more lead. Guess what? Since every winemaker in the world wants to sell in California, every winemaker in the world took the lead out of their capsules. Fascinating way that one little regulation in California ended up making a regulation for the entire world. Pretty cool. So now the next thing you gotta do, remember this step, put the knife away, okay? <laughs> Don't forget that. You'll have rosé wine if you forget. So now what we're going to do is open it up, and we're going to open this. And what we're going to do is take, and I put my thumb behind it like a thumbtack, and I'm going to put it right in the center. Now, you don't put the point in the center because then it would be off center. So you put the point of the, uh, of the screw a little off center so that it's right in the center of the cork. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin to twist. Now, a lot of people get about this far. See, it's not all the way in. And they decide that they've gotten tired of screwing. And they stop. And they put this lever here. And now you can see this is horizontal. I can tell you one thing for sure. The human arm does not go from here to here. And it would have to do that in order for me to do this. This is why you see people like tuck a bottle between their knees, not the way you wanna open wine elegantly, okay? So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna go back to screwing. And we're gonna screw it in all the way down until, see how close that is? Okay, can you see that? Yeah, you can see that, right? So now what we're gonna do is put this on and you'll notice something changed. Look at the angle of the handle now. Now this angle, Industrial designers, lawnmowers, chainsaws, okay, all kinds of power tools, they start it with this pulling motion because that's the most powerful pulling motion in the human body. So lo and behold, this industrial designer knew that, and now watch, I'm gonna pull, and voila. No cork, no matter how stuck, can overcome the power of that pull. So now, we're back to the original problem. Look at that. I've got that horizontal and my arm's gonna have to go from here to here. No, because you see this? Now I've got a thumb hold. I can hang the bottle right on it. It's perfectly balanced. And now you'll notice with the thumb hold, what you're gonna see here is that there's a thumb hold here and finger holds all the way down to the last thumb hold, see? So what I'm gonna do is just take my hand and I'm going to squeeze two fingers down, two fingers up. See the two fingers up? See the two fingers down? I, I, you know, I can't do that Star Trek thing. How do they, I don't know. Anyway, thank you. So now I'm just going to squeeze. And because this is a double fulcrum, it has a fulcrum here and a fulcrum here, double fulcrum, the vector of force is going to pull the cork directly out. Remember I said my thumb would be down here at the end? There it is, right in that thumb hold. See, I went from here, pushing, pushing, pushing. Look at that, perfect. And the cork can't break because it's reinforced with steel. There's no way to break that cork, it's impossible. So you're not gonna do that thing. You know, when you did it halfway, and you pushed and it snapped and you got a little piece of cork and the minute you looked, it dropped into the bottle. 
that's not going to happen when you do this this way. This is going to make it really easy. Then what we're going to do is we're going to unscrew the core. And if you want to get fancy and get cool with it, you palm it. Okay, practice your palming. All right. And we're going to pull it out, snap it closed, fold it down one handed. That's waiter style and stick it in your pocket. Okay. Now the core, you know, they hand it to you and they put it on the table. Here's why. You give it a squeeze. You give it a sniff. If it smells like a gym locker, be very concerned that maybe this wine is not going to be as good as you want it to be. If it crumbles in your hand, maybe oxygen's gotten in the bottle. It doesn't tell you the wine is bad, but what it does do, it tells you you need to exercise a little extra caution with this wine, okay? And we're going to put it down on the table, and then we're going to pour a taste. Now, to pour the taste, we need to talk about wine glasses. See this glass? This is not a wine glass. This is a martini glass. The reason that we don't use a martini glass with wine is because if we poured a little of our wine in here and the bouquet starts to come up, because it's got this big open top, what's going to happen is the air is going to come in and carry it away. So the second glass that we want to take a look at is a wine glass like this. That's a pretty good wine glass, right? But then we've got another wine glass that we want to take a look at here. And this is the wine glass you want to be using. See that big baby? Look at that. That's a, now that's a wine glass, okay? You don't want this silly little thing. It's not bad, it's okay. But around here we use it for water. We use this guy for the wine and that's what you want. So why is this different? Well, number one, it's got a thin neck, a narrow neck and a fat belly, just like me. It also has other body parts. It has a lip, it has a foot, there's a stem, okay? And what we're gonna do is, is that we're gonna pour a little bit of wine in that and we're gonna give it a swirl. Now, why are we gonna swirl it? We're gonna swirl it and I recommend you swirl, you learn to swirl with the, with the glass on the table, okay? Later on, you'll learn to swirl up in the air. But if you try doing that, you're going to stain some shirts if you try it right off the bat. So I got a white wine here, and we're going to give it a swirl. And now when we swirl it, it's getting up on the side of the glass. And that's going to enable us to start the evaporation process and dramatically increase the evaporation because the nose is 10,000 10, times more powerful than my palate. So what I want to do is first taste with my eyes. I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to look at the wine. How clear is it? Is it the color of hay, the color of gold? Is it red? Is it got brick color, rust color? Look at the color. Look at the clarity. See how clear that is? Okay. And now you probably can't see it, but on the sides of the glass, you'll start to see the legs as it sheets down. If the wine has a lot of glycerin in it, it's going to sheet in big rivulets. If it pulls away from the glass, like rain on a waxy windshield, then you know that's what's going to happen on your palate. So that big, thick, oozing legs is going to coat your palate up and create a long finish with the wine. So now we give it a swirl, and now we're going to give it a sniff. Now, you're not going to give it, yeah, if you're at home, okay? Don't do a little, try to sniff it up here. Get your nose down there. Imagine there was like fog in the glass by that evaporation. You want to pull all that right, right out. Give it a good sniff. Now, if you want to be a wine snob, okay, the reason we have the stem is because once the wine's at the right temperature, if we take Newton's law of thermodynamics, the body of the greater mass will transmit heat to the body of the lesser mass, I being the greater mass, the glass being the lesser mass, which means that me at 98.6 is going to warm the wine up very quickly to 98.6 if I'm holding it like this. So you don't hold it like this unless your wine is too cold and you want to warm it up a little bit. The reason we have the stem is, is that there, there could be no transmission of BTUs. No heat is going to go through that stem into my wine. So when I've got wine at the right temperature, keep it at the right temperature by keeping your hands off the glass. If you want to be a wine snob, you hold it by the foot of the glass <laughs> and you walk around acting like, oh my God, how far am I from the sun? All right, so what we're gonna do here 
is now is give it a taste. And if you want to taste and you sniff before you taste, you can either do a normal sniff, you can do a real wine sniff, or you can do the Doppler sniff. This is a wine snob, holds it by the bottom and goes, like you're at Indy, okay? And then you're gonna taste it. Now, mm. oh, oh, good for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. I'm telling you, that's delicious. So look at, you notice that when you taste the wine, a lot of times you let it go zing, like right down the middle of your tongue. And what is happening physiologically there, any uh, anatomy a teacher will tell you that you just hit a few thousand nerve cells, you pinged them as it ran across it, but you didn't take advantage of the whole thing. So now what I want you to do is taste your wine like it was Listerine. Okay, you ready? Do it with me. Here we go. Get it behind the molars, roof of the mouth, up in front of the gums, get it all around. And then after you swallow, little breath in. Okay? Totally different experience, isn't it? You know why? Because you just hit thousands and thousands of nerve cells that were pinging away. So imagine you got a little guy up here in your brain, right? And the little guy's controlling everything and the brain is saying what it always says. Can't you find me some pleasure? Can't you find me something fun to do? Can't you find me something good to eat? Can't you find me a, a drink that I like, a comfortable place, a beach to lay on? That's all the brain wants. It wants pleasure all the time. And there's a little guy in your head who's assigned with finding the pleasure. So what happens is, is that when you do this and the brain says, hey, Dodo, what are you doing? You just did that silly little rivulet. Do what Bob said, swirl it all around. And boom, the board lights up in front of the guy and all these cells are going off and he's going, whoa, brain, I got some fun for you. So what happens is, is that you got to get the nerve cells activated in order for the brain to receive the messages, analyze the wine, and enjoy it. Now, what we're going to do is talking about the likelihood of enjoying different things with it. So let's suppose I've got some food that I'm eating with my wine. And... Because I've eaten some food, maybe it's got some fat in it, maybe it's got some cream in it, maybe it's got some butter in it. And what's going to happen is they're going to gum up all those nerve receptors I was talking about. Now, in a bottle of wine, okay, if we look at this, there are basically three big things in wine. The first, 85%, up to about here, is water. It's all water. About 12 to 13% is alcohol. And the last 2% is about 200 other items, but one of the principal ones is acid. Now, I've just mentioned three things that are cleaners. You jump in the shower in the morning and you use water, lots of water, because water itself is not a great cleaner, which is why you use soap. The same is true in wine. If you're going to clean your palate, get that fat off, get all that stuff that gunked it up, then water alone isn't going to do it, which is why your brain is saying, don't reach for the water glass, reach for the wine glass. So what's happening is, is that we now are going to take advantage of the fact that we've got that alcohol in here. Could you imagine on a winter's day rubbing your hands? Yeah, I used to say this and say everybody said, no, I can't imagine rubbing my hands with alcohol. It's all we do. You probably rubbed your hands with alcohol 20 times today, right? Hand sanitizer is alcohol. And we know it makes your hands raw. So what it does in your palate is that when you take a sip, that acid goes to work. Rhode Island used to be a big jewelry industry place. A lot of manufacturers, they used to put the jewelry in an acid bath to clean it before they plated it with gold. It had to be perfectly clean so they would dip it in acid. So what we've got is we've got a combination of three cleaners, water, alcohol, which is a very good cleaner, and that acid is the last cleaner. You know, a couple of drops, just a drop of acid on your hand, it would burn it and the skin would peel off. So even though there's a tiny bit of acid in the bottle, it's going to have a lot of cleaning power. So we want to remember that. 
because what we find is, is wines that are red tend to be more powerful with more alcohol and more acid in them. That's a clue. It's a clue to how we're going to think about the way in which we pair food and wine. So let's imagine I've just got something simple. And now instead of Coke and Pepsi, I want you to think about um, Woolite and Tide. So what we're looking at is, is that if we had uh, some delicates that we wanted to clean, we wouldn't scrub them with Tide. We would gently clean them with Woolite. If you were to take an oyster on the half shell, maybe just put a little bit of cocktail sauce on it and eat it, you would not have gotten any kind of fat. You wouldn't have gotten anything that's going to gum up your palate, that's going to coat those nerve cells. So you don't want to go in with a big job cleaner. You want to go in with a nice light wine, like a light white wine maybe like this, a Sauvignon Blanc, okay? Now, I just mentioned before Chardonnay. Earlier, I mentioned uh, the Pinot Noir. Then I mentioned the uh, Sauvignon Blanc. And now what I want you to do is I'm gonna explain those to you. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. And every word I say, I want you to try to create a vibrant food memory of the word that I'm saying to you. Okay, close your eyes. Here we go. And now, Red Delicious, Macintosh, Empire, Cortland, Granny Smith, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Gris, Muscat. Open your eyes. Who got a better sense of taste memory from the list of apples than they did from the second list. Okay, the reason is, is because apples are a fruit that we remember from the time we were kids. We don't start drinking this stuff until it's much later, okay? And we don't have some of those taste memories, but the differences are the same. There are, like uh, a Red Delicious is a really sweet apple, there are grapes that are really sweet. There are grapes that are really sour. There are grapes that are bitter. There are grapes that are high in acid, okay? So what's happening with this wine is we wanna recognize that each one of those grapes is going to lend a different flavor to the wine, just as if you were to press Red Delicious or Macintosh, they wouldn't taste the same. So it's a difference in fruit, and that's something you wanna remember with this. So what we wanna do is now to take uh, our different flavor sensations and we want to take the fact that we know this is good at cleaning and we want to think about different ways that we sort of gum up our palate. So one way we would do that is by the native fat content of the food. So we all know that chicken has less fat in it than ribeye steak. We know that uh, sole has less fat than salmon. We know Bluefish is really fatty, okay? We know tenderloin doesn't have a lot of fat. So we know, because of all the education about diet, we kind of know the fat content of a lot of foods. The second thing we want to consider is how are we cooking it? Are we using a cooking method that is going to increase the fat in it? We could boil it in oil. That's called deep frying, right? Uh, we, could, we could thinly slice it and eat it raw. Uh, we could have it as a sashimi or as a sushi. We could roast it, bake it, grill it, let the fat drip down, burn, and come back up and stick on it, okay? The, the, the method of cooking is going to either add more fat or take fat away. And then the last thing we're gonna do that determines how what, what wine we're gonna want is we're gonna wanna figure out what sauce we're putting on it. Are we putting a Bernays? Bernays sauce is made with egg yolk and butter, two of the stickiest things on the planet. You get that all over your palate, it's not coming off. You're gonna need the big job cleaner. So you want to use, in that instance, let's take, and we'll do the three columns, right? Let's take a ribeye steak, charcoal grill it, and put Bernays sauce on it. 
oh my God, call out the professional cleaning company. In order to get your palate clean and those nerve cells fresh and ready to get pinged by the flavor of the food, you're gonna need to clean. Now, if you reach for the glass of water, the guy in your brain's gonna go, no way, the water's not gonna do it. Find a more powerful cleaner. So now your brain knows enough to say, well, let's go with this red wine because this not only has 85% water, it has 13% alcohol, powerful cleaner, and it's got a lot of tannic acid in it, which means this is like sending in the power scrubbers and the hoses and the guys in boots to clean your palate, okay? Now, if it was just an oyster on the half shell with just a little bit of cocktail sauce, we want woolite. Because if you send in the big job cleaner, it's gonna over scrub your palate. It's gonna make it raw the way your hands get raw when you put too much of the uh, hand sanitizer on it, okay? So you can over scrub your palate with the wine. You don't wanna do that. So this has less alcohol, less acid, and now it's just gonna refresh the palate. It's like cleaning with woolite rather than doing the big scrubbing job with the tide over here. So every time you look at a food and you're trying to decide, do I want to go with a light white wine or a heavy red wine? The answer is going to be, well, how big is the cleaning job on my palate? If I've got a big cleaning job, if I've got ribeye steak, Bernay sauce, charcoal grilled, send in the troops. If I've just taken a little bit of tenderloin, poached it in beef broth, you know, and added a little crumble of herb. I don't need a big cleaning job. I want a lighter red wine for that, okay? So you want to pick it duck, very fatty. Uh, and then I'm going to roast the duck. Maybe I'll confit it the way we do here at Poto Fur, where we slowly cook it for three hours in duck fat. You know that needs a monster red, okay? And when the chef puts that demi glace ras raspberry reduction on it, oh, you're, you're never going to get it off your palate. So you need a big cleaner for that. So that's how you pick according to the cleaning power of the wine. Now, the second thing that's really important about wine is, is using it as spice. You want to use your wine as the spice that goes along with the meal that you're having. So. We all know butter and lobster go together. We know that steak and pepper goes together. We know ham goes with pineapple, pork goes with apples, right? We know that duck goes great with, with raspberries and fruit sauces. We already know these combinations. We know that um, if, you, if you were to take, um, let's, let's say we, we've got chicken and rosemary right, with some garlic in it, very herbal. Maybe we've got a white fish that we just sprinkle fresh herbs over and bake. Now, you'll also notice, and this is the thing that a lot of people miss, is have you ever noticed that somebody would say, oh, that's a, how would you describe that Chardonnay? Oh, it's a big buttery Chardonnay, it's really oaky, okay? Well, I wanna ask you, do you think a big buttery Chardonnay would go with lobster? You bet it would, because the butter quality in the wine is going to enhance the lobster the same way real butter does. I got one over here. This is a Cote de Rhone. This is a very peppery wine. Steak au poivre, one of the most famous dishes in the world, steak with pepper. So you look at this and you say, wow, the Cote de Rhone, ooh, very peppery. Do you think it'll go with steak? Of course it will go with steak. It'll go great with steak. Take a Fumé Blanc a very, you'll hear people describe a Fumé Blanc as being very herbaceous. Do you think that a Fumé Blanc with a lot of herbal quality will go with a nice piece of scrod? Yes, because fresh herbs and scrod go together. An, a wine that has an apple crispness to it, you'll hear people say that. It's or a wine, there's a lot of tropical in this. If there's a lot of tropical, pineapple's tropical. It probably goes well with ham. Duck, you know, we get Merlot's all the time. People say, oh, Merlot has this big jammy quality. Well, that berry flavor that you get in the Merlot is going to go with the duck. So we're going to use it 
in two ways. One, spice. Two, cleaning power. And when you put these two together, you will be able to pair wines like an expert because you will be an expert because what you're going to know is that you want to pick a wine that is suited to the cleaning job and that on the basis of spice is matching up head to head with the food you're having. So get that buttery Chardonnay and have a lobster. Anything that goes well with butter, you want to do that. Now, I'm going to tell you a trick that they use. The difference between red and white wine, important to know. They're made differently. So we've got grapes that are growing in the vineyards. And you also notice that grapes grow, all the famous wine regions are valley, Napa Valley, Sonoma Valley, okay? The Alexander Valley, uh, all over Europe. They, because have you ever sat by a pool in a chaise lounge? Do you lay flat? No, you prop it up at a 45 degree angle so that you're getting more sun. The, the hillsides are the back of the chaise lounge. The valley is the flat part of the chaise lounge. You get more sun at this angle. That's why the best wines come from the hillsides rather than the valley floor. The valley floor produces the jug wine. The hillside produces because it's getting the sun. So you've only got about 120 days. If you're a vintner, you've got about 120 days of sun to get enough sugar into the grape that it can be made into alcohol. So let's work backwards. It takes a certain quantity of sugar. And that sugar, when you press the grape and the juice comes out, you introduce yeast. Yeast loves to eat sugar, just like us. Starts to eat the sugar and it produces two things, carbon dioxide and alcohol. Now, if it were champagne, like in this glass, we wanna keep the carbon dioxide dissolved in the wine and when we open it, the bubbles come out. If it's a still wine, the vintner lets the carbon dioxide go off into the air naturally during the fermentation process. So what we get behind is the alcohol is left behind, the yeast eats it all, and the yeast dies, it starves to death, basically is what happens, because it's eaten all the sugar. So what happens is, is that we press the grape. If we, and all, all grape juice is clear. It, it, red grapes don't make red juice, they make clear juice. But what we do if we wanna make a red wine is we take the skins and the seeds and the stems and we put them all in a giant vat with the wine and it begins to decompose. It's rotting, it's decomposing. But the good news is the yeast has started to increase the alcohol, which means it's, it's decomposing in a sanitary way. It's not gonna be harmful to us. So they let all of the pigment in the skins come out and that's when a lot of tannic acid comes out. And tannic acid is what gives these big red wines their power. So we get tannic acid from woody substances. So suppose you went to make a Chardonnay and you're not gonna have any of that tannic acid. You're not gonna get all that great skin color, the purple. But what you can do is if you found a wood out in nature that maybe had a lot of tannin in it, suppose you made a barrel out of that wood and then you poured this wine into the barrel and let it ferment in it and a lot of that tannic acid soaked in from the wood into the wine. It's like sending the wine to the gym to get all pumped up, okay? It's making it stronger. So if you have an unoaked Chardonnay, it tends to be much more of a wool-like kind of wine. If you have an oaked aged Chardonnay, it's gone to the gym for nine months or a year or two years. It's gotten pumped up and it's going to do a great job of cleansing your palate because the tannin isn't coming from the skin. The tannin is coming from the wood. So you can put the wine into the wood and get the tannin into the wine and make it even stronger. 
And that will also give it a lot of the buttery flavor in a Chardonnay also comes from the oak. So they're adding flavor to it. A winemaker's adding flavor. Now, the difference between a sweet wine and a, I told you the difference between white and red, sweet and, spark, and dry, and then I'll tell you still and sparkling. So sweet and dry is the winemaker lets the yeast eat all of the sugar that was in the juice. There's no more sugar molecules in the bottle for you to taste. So it tastes dry to you. That's the phrase we use, a dry wine. If the winemaker shuts the yeast down partway through, when there's still some sugar left in the wine, then when you taste it, you'll taste the sugar. The way he does it, he puts it in a big refrigerated vat, turns it on, takes the temperature down, yeast Anybody who bakes bread knows yeast is super sensitive to temperature. So what happens is the yeast dies off and you end up with the sugar you're tasting. So you taste it as a sweet wine. With a sparkling wine, what happens is that we do what Dom Perignon discovered. He was a blind monk and he was trying to sell wine. He was looking for a gimmick. Everybody sold still wine. He noticed this little frizziness in it decided that maybe there was a way to keep that sparkle in it. He's the one who discovered that if you put a cork and wire it shut, that the carbon dioxide will stay dissolved in the liquid. It's like soda, it's like beer, it's like champagne, okay? Charles Boyle is the chemist in England who discovered Boyle's law, which tells you how much gas you can dissolve in the liquid in a closed vessel. And then when we unclose it, called opening it, boom, the carbon dioxide starts to come out of the liquid and those are the bubbles. That's what you see, the bubbles in champagne. So that's the difference between still and sparkling. All right? So now I want you to begin to think about wine tasting because after this, I know you're going to be eager to do a lot more wine tasting. And I want you to understand how winemakers work. And I want you to imagine two winemakers. One guy wakes up in the morning and uh, it's kind of late, the sun has already come up. Uh, he looks to one side and there's a beautiful naked woman. He looks to the other side, there's another one. And he realizes it was quite a time last night. And he gets up and he says, gotta go. And he pulls on his leathers and uh, puts on his big hobnail boots and goes out and gets on his Harley and goes roaring down to the winery. And he gets in there and he goes, hey, what do you got for me to make today? I want to make a beast of a wine, because that's who he is. He's a beast in a bottle kind of guy. And on the way to the winery, he passed a friend of his, another winemaker, and he gave him a little honk on his Harley. And uh, that guy uh, woke up, uh, you know, really early, went for a ride, did some yoga, pulled on his Birkenstocks and his real hemp jeans, got on his bicycle and started riding to the winery. And he gets to his winery and he says, what did, what did we harvest yesterday? I, I just really want to make a beautiful, soft hug. of. A, I want to make a wine that hugs the people who drink it. Okay? Now, those two philosophies are very different. And they're both perfectly fine. Okay? They're both great. I love drinking the wine from the guy on the Harley Hellbent for Leather and War. Okay? That's a great, that's a beast in a bottle and you're going to let it out and it's going to be amazing. But the other guy is going to coax a genie out of that bottle and the genie's going to fulfill your wishes and it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be ready to drink. You're not going to have to age it. Okay? So the philosophy of the winemaker is really important. So if you find out, like these guys, they put their name here, Nicholas, I guess it's backwards, Nicholas. Um, they have a philosophy about wine, and their philosophy is to make very approachable wines, high quality. They're French, but, but they don't want it to age for years. They want you to drink it soon. So one of the things you want to do is, is that if you taste a wine, uh, and it says Nicholas, and you say, wow, I love Nicholas Pinot Noir. Now you want to try the Nicholas Cabernet the Nicholas Chardonnay, the Nicholas Sauvignon Blanc, the Nicholas Rosé. Why? Because they struck a nerve with you. That literal phrase, strike a nerve, that's what I'm talking about. You liked the way it tasted because the nerve response on your palate was so pleasing. 
So what you want to do here is that you now want to taste across that line. If conversely, you taste this monster Cote de Rhone, right, from uh, the parent family, and, and you taste the second wine, again, you go like, oh my God, I, it's like letting a dragon out of the bottle you probably aren't going to like their other wines because they're making them in a style. The guy on the Harley doesn't pull in the next day and go, you know, oh, namaste, everybody. You know, I want to make this really soft, uh, approachable, friendly Merlot today. They don't go, what's wrong with you? Are you still drunk? I mean, come on, something's not right. This is not you. So, you know that they're going to be making wines in that style. And if you like the style, stick with it. If you don't like the style, move on. Try more wines until you start to find, and you can do the same thing with a region. You know, all of a sudden you're like, I had no idea. The Burgundy region, their traditions, I love it. They're approachable. They're great with food. You know, this is the wine I want to be with. Go down to Bordeaux. They're all down there in their castles. You know, in Burgundy, everybody's in a little place and they all own a little piece of the vineyard. It's very communal. They call them communes. They're very together people. Okay? Go down to Bordeaux. What do you see? Oh my God. Drive a mile down the road to the chateau, the monster place. I'll tell you how it's done. We are the rulers of the world and our wine acts like the ruler of the world. So you better like it. And if you don't like it, we don't care. Okay? So that's the attitude of the people in Bordeaux. They're rich, they're, they're powerful. They don't care about you peasants, you serfs, okay? So that's why a lot of times when you get their wine, you're kind of saying to yourself, ooh, I'm not so sure. This wine is really, ooh, I don't, it's not user-friendly because Bordeaux isn't user-friendly, okay? But go to Burgundy and you're gonna find a lot of really nice, soft, easy, good wines great wines, complex wines, layers of flavor, huge, great tradition, but different philosophy, different way of life, communal way of life versus, you know, we're the big powerful chateau. So there's all of these different pieces that play into it. I could go on for hours more, as I think you can tell, but I got about 10 more minutes, and if you could unmute everybody, uh, yeah. uh, I'll take questions. Any questions about anything to do with wine or wine making or wine storage or vintages or anything else? Um, I will, I, Valerie O is here and Valerie did um, have a question. Valerie, Great. Do, you, do you want to ask or do you want me to ask it for you? Are you unmuted? Hello. Hi, Valerie. Hi. Um, what is a good pairing for uh, sushi with, uh, other than sake? Ah, oh, damn it. That's the only thing you can't drink wine with. <laughs> no good pairing. Good pairings. answer. There are no good pairings. No, of course. You know, there's lots of good pairings. Part of it depends on how much you like wasabi, okay? And, um, you know, again, is it, is it the katana roll? Is it got the tempura uh, shrimp in it? Um, has it got lots of avocado? Measure your fat content, okay? Now, if it's sashimi, you know, we're looking at, at the fattiest thing there is, is probably going to be toro, okay? Uh, tuna, uh, toro, uh, maybe a salmon. So I think you're going to find with anything along the lines of, um, uh, uh, of, of raw fish, uh, a lot of Japanese food, you're going to find uh, white wines are definitely going to go better. And I'm also going to throw out the idea that maybe a little sweetness because you get a lot of saltiness. You get a lot of salty profiles in Japanese uh, dishes and that salty sweet combination could be a good, good one to work with. And then we have a question from Verena. Verena, do you want to ask? You want me to go ahead? Sure, I can do that. Um, first of all, thank you for this and you're hysterical. Um, <laughs> who, who knew that learning about this could be so much fun? Um, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, maybe I'm just never gonna like 
Sauvignon Blanc, but I, I just can't seem to find one whenever I've tried one. And I didn't know if there was one that you might recommend that you feel is, you know, without being like, you know, a hundred dollars a bottle, like a brand, uh, uh, one that you may um, recommend. You sound like my sister. She keeps bringing <laughs> home guys we don't like. Okay. <laughs> Stop bringing home guys you don't like, but get, break up with Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. Just break up with it. All okay. Right? There are so many other great wines out there. All right. Yep. Try a Pinot Grigio. Try a Pinot Gris. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Not, I'm not a fan I, of Pinot Gris either. I'm, I'm a more of a shot for white wine. More, much more of a Chardonnay girl. Okay. So, um, so why are you trying to move on? Uh, you, know, you know, you've got a good relationship. <laughs> you know, fix the relationship. You know, spice it up a little. Try an Australian Chardonnay. You know, get two <laughs> bottles and have a threesome. Uh, you know, just have more fun with your wine. And don't be out there looking for another wine when you've got a wine that you already like at home, okay? So That's, my recommendation yeah. is you need to break up with Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> you need to do it now and kick that Sauvignon Blanc bottle to the door, kick it out to the curb, and don't even bother trying to figure out a way to like it. That works for me. That's kind of where I've been going. Other but great wines, you know? <laughs> yes, I agree. It's too easy. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And our next, we have another question. This one is it comes from the people that I think if we were giving out prizes, we'd get a prize because I liked the way you follow the directions about trying the different ways to hold the glasses. And that's Jessica and her friend. And they have a question about um, Moscato. So do you want to unmute yourselves and ask your question there? Hello, this is my roommate, Emily. She also graduated from UMass Dartmouth. Yay. Um, we would like to know what goes good with Moscato Sangria. Okay, so first of all, Moscato is really great. And Moscato is something uh, you want to think about as an after-dinner champagne, okay? I love the bubbles and the finish. Try Moscato with a little salty cheese, okay, like a blue cheese a Roquefort, a Stilton, maybe a little figs, some walnuts. That Moscato flavor goes with so many desserts. It's a great combination. It's a great dessert wine. In France, they make a wine called Muscat de Baume de Venise. So remember I said certain fruits, certain um, grapes have a natural sweetness that's higher. And these, a lot of times, the Moscato approaches what's called um, the, the um, late harvest, which means that they let the grapes stay on the vine even longer and they let some of the water go out so you get a higher sugar concentration. And the other thing that the Moscato is good with is, is that it's an inexpensive pairing with foie gras, okay? Because the sweet Sauterne, super expensive, is a great pairing with foie gras, uh, but if you want to spend the money on the foie and have a wine that goes with it, the Moscato is a good choice with that. Moscato is also nice just, you know, for sipping because there's so many wines I talked about. If you're just sipping this glass, it's over scrubbing your palate. So there's, there are a lot of wines that are great with food. There are other wines that are great for sipping and Moscato is a great sipping wine. It's a great breakfast wine too, by the way, by the by. You know. I love your suggestion. No Cabernet for breakfast. No. Too, too early. <laughs> too early for Cabernet. Um, and then we have Miriam who would like to know if you have, um, if you can suggest a great ice wine. Well, there's two kinds of ice wine, real ice wine and ice wine where they take grapes and put them in a freezer. Okay. So number one, make sure you're getting the real thing. If you really want to, if you really want to have a go with ice wine, the Canadians make a lot of it. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, 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 it's great stuff. It is in the category of the late harvest. And I'll explain late harvest to you. Uh, you've got, uh, in chemistry, your concentration is how much of one thing is there to how much of another thing. And in this case, it's how much sugar is there to how much water. So, in a normal wine, you just press it and you're at a concentration that's a normal concentration. If you let the grapes shrivel up on the vine, 
at the end of the growing season, the water goes away, but the sugar stays. You don't lose any sugar. So the concentration of sugar is higher. Now imagine you wanted a technique where you said, gee, I'd like the sugar concentration to be even higher. So if you froze the grape and it formed into crystals, the water formed into crystals and you pressed it and you just got the sugar out because the sugar doesn't freeze. Sugar doesn't freeze as fast as water. So when you squeeze it, you're leaving behind the water and you're getting super sugar concentrated wine. And that's why the ice wine is sweet. It's delicious. And I would suggest it with many of the things with the Moscato. It's good with salty things, salty cheeses, okay? It's good with smoked fish. It's good with foie gras. It's good with desserts. Um, but if you really want to do it, get the real deal, okay? Not something that they just parked in a big walk-in freezer, you know, somewhere because they had extra grapes to sell that year. All right? And then we have, Who else? we have a question. When you go to a restaurant, the server takes your drink order first and then your meal order. Isn't it easy to end up with a mismatch in your food and wine pairing? You're always gonna end up with a mismatch of food and wine unless you're eating alone at restaurants, okay? Here's, here's the problem, and this is the, the fallacy of this. If, if, if four of us go out to dinner, okay, uh, and one of us gets the sole, and one of us gets the filet mignon or the, the ribeye steak, and one of us gets the duck, and one of us gets the chicken, okay? There is no perfect wine for those four dishes. It doesn't exist. It's a compromise. Whatever you're going to get, okay? So what do I do? I order the ribeye steak. I say, let me see the wine list. I order, offer a wine that's going to go perfectly with the ribeye steak. And then when everybody else goes, eh, I wasn't, they didn't like the, I go, ha ha, mine was great. Okay. Because that's why you want to order the wine. So you can order a bottle that goes with your entree. Okay. Let them have a mismatch. There's no reason for you to suffer. You went to the seminar. You learned how to do it. They did nothing. Let them pay the price of drinking bad wine mismatched with their food. So give up on the idea that there's a perfect bottle, okay? The best thing you can do is if you're in a situation where it's really skewed that way, you've got, you know, from light fish to heavy beef, order two bottles. Order a white, order a red. Make me happy. I'm having a tough time. Somebody's got to support this enterprise. You think I'm going to do it doing Zooms? No, you got to come down here. Order my most expensive wines. Have my best of everything, appetizers, soup, salad, entree, dessert. Keep the wine coming. You know, we need your help. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. If we don't have any more questions, we are at seven o'clock. Um, and I think, yes, Bob, thank you so much. That was brilliant. Um, and we all owe Muffy big time. Um, Muffy, Marianne Sullivan is a colleague who is, uh, shares a fence with Bob and uh, Bob can never say no to what Muffy asks. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Bob. Um, I also want to mention that I did put a link into the chat um, to a, a piece that was in the Providence Journal. And it talks about how Bob has really changed his restaurant to make people safe. Um, and it is, um, he has used um, Aaron Bromage's recommendations. And Aaron, of course, is um, a professor at um, UMass Dartmouth. So it's really just kind of like this nice connection um, and kind of serendipitous because uh, Bob um, was way into Aaron and what Aaron was doing long before we asked him to do this for us. So I thank you, Bob. And then I do want to apologize because I demoted our acting uh, chancellor um, to vice chancellor when I introduced him. And I'm so sorry because he is our acting chancellor. Um, and so I'm, I'm very sorry and I apologize for that. Um, and I thank you all for coming. Um, I certainly hope you'll consider um, a nice trip to a, a safe dinner out at Potafu and make sure you go to the one that's in Rhode Island because there are many others. Um, and when you go, you can't go wrong with the menu. I think I've had everything on it. 
Um, but I would recommend the beef bourguignon, which is my personal favorite. And I have it with, I always have it with the, um, a really snooty Bordeaux. So <laughs> there it is. It's got your name on it. Uh, <laughs> I'm, right, I'm writing Anne Marie on it right now. It's got your name on it. So thank you all so much for coming. I hope you have enjoyed this as much as I have. And I, I hope to see you sitting um, eight feet away from me some night at Kudafu. And thank you all. <laughs>